Well, thank you very much, David, for that um, extraordinary um, uh, walk through what's happening in the States. Um, in the work that you've published on polarization, you do ask that question, you know, so what? When, when do we really care about polarization? When do we say it's a bad thing? And it uh, seems that one of the major things that is a truly problematic issue is when, even if the electorate is not that split, nevertheless, the parties wind up split and you wind up with issues that get gridlocked. And that's particularly an issue where you've got super majoritarian requirements and therefore neither side can get anything to happen. Do you think that that kind of gridlock is increasing in the states and how much of a problem is it? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, first of all, the danger of the polarization of the parties like that is, uh, the first, first danger is that over time it erodes Americans' trust in their government and uh, we have seen some of that. Americans' trust in government, they, 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 don't, they don't like that. They want the parties to work together. Um, Sec so the first sort of sub-problem with that is you would think it would be hard to have an electorate that was centrist and parties that was polarized in equal... You can understand that for a short run, but in equilibrium, why should that be? Why shouldn't the parties then... Why shouldn't candidates then try to get to the middle where the voters are, and why doesn't it work that way? And so there must be something going on there that allows that to happen, that, that's not good. And, and there are a bunch of people who have speculation about what it is, but no, no real evidence. Uh, part of it is the juice from both parties. By juice, I mean the money, the ideas, etc., come from the left and the right. They drive it. Uh, and, uh, and the American primary system, where we have democracy within the party as well as between, forces candidates left in the primary, in the Democratic Party, right in the Republican Party. So that, that's, that's one answer. That, that's bad. The second part, and now is more speculation, is there are some issues that maybe can't, uh, it maybe can't be resolved. Uh, I'll give one example where it, it seems to me uh, conservative and liberal differences are not, not going to go away on this. Uh, so, and then where, where I don't think it's so bad, to have the argument, and the second one where they don't go away, but it probably is bad to have the argument. So the first one is uh, 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 global warming, that, that whole set of issues. So our conservative approach to that is to say, you know, you can't regulate that. You can, you can pretend, you can have a conference in Kyoto, and you can have everybody but the United States sign on to that and say, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then nobody does it, and that what they do is they then meet in Copenhagen. More Great. <laughs> so they have more stuff like that, and you sign on more stuff, and you don't do it. Uh, or the, uh, the or, or then, but then you want to try cap and trade, etc. Uh, and in short, you want the government involved in the problem. Uh, a second approach is to say, well, you want markets to work, and so if the price of energy goes high enough, what'll happen is venture capitalists, scientists, people will figure out they can make money, and the way they're going to make money is uh, is when that price is high, and that's the way to solve it because that'll generate the technology that'll solve it. Now. I can tell you which side I'm on, but if you put a, a gun to my head and say, is there scientific evidence that you're right on that? No, it's what kind of what drives an ideology. I don't see how you resolve that issue uh, in any science. You either believe one or the other, and you take your chance on that with the policy, and it works or it doesn't work. So that, that's, so that's, I don't think that's so bad that that's an argument. On health care in the United States, I do think... Uh, I do think it's not so good to, to, to have the, the, the notion of... Uh, now, I'm not a particular fan of the plan that President Obama... Uh, 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 well, the plan that the United States Congress came up with because I don't think it essentially... It, I think it's good that it increases the number of people covered. I don't think it's good in the sense that it doesn't deal with cost issues. It uh, just doesn't deal with cost issues. And, and so when, but, but the one argument may be, well, that's okay, uh, pass it, and then we'll have more people covered and we'll take care of the cost issues as they come up. Uh, but in this case, the Democrats say, well, let's do anything. And the Republicans' view is, let's do nothing. I, I, that, that strikes me as not a healthy, healthy debate. There are good ideas on both sides that are relevant to uh, the issue of how you contain costs. And uh, I find the debate on health care not very appealing uh, because not, not, uh, ne neither side is making any realistic comments. And and so what happens is independence and others sort of turn off on the process. So I, I think sometimes the arguments uh, for polarization are legitimate, that real differences that 
you can't determine and sometimes they're bad. So I gave an example of each and mm. that's it. Um, one of the stories that lies behind this polarization is, is um, how it's happened and indeed, you know, whether, whether it is possible to change it. And I think in your closing remarks as you were um, making your presentation, you were suggesting that this isn't at least in part a consequence of external economic impacts. Do you think that there is any institutional um, issues behind it? I, if there were differences in American institutional arrangements, might we have less polarization? Yes. Uh, if I had one reform that I could pick, I would get rid of uh, America's primary. I would get rid of primary system where Democrats run against Democrats and Republicans run, run against Republicans. Uh, so, for example, in California, there's a uh, bipartisan effort to create open primaries. Uh, so, so American politics, one thing that makes it great uh, from, from my perspective is it's so complicated. It goes across the 50 states, so you always need somebody to explain it. Uh, and, and that's great for me. It not, may not be great for the country, but it means I get to go around and give a lot of talks. Uh, uh, all right, so what would happen if you got rid of those primaries? So we had an open primary, so we tried for an open primary in California, where, uh, which, which means anybody can walk in and vote in either primary they want. I don't have to be a Democrat. I don't have to be I vote in whatever primary I want. And the data shows that the states that have that get much more centrist candidates, much more willing to uh, do compromises. So th there are some institutional uh, reasons uh, to account for reform. I, I do want to mention one other thing about polarization. So if you think in the United States before Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal, and there are elections in Australia that do the same, uh, the two elections in Britain that did it were Campbell-Bannerman in 1906 and then the Labor Party in 1946. There are, uh, if you think about it, the, the issue was in the United States before uh, Roosevelt, welfare or no welfare. Th that was the issue. Some Democrats starting in the 20s, uh, with the farm movement, and then Al Smith in 28 wanted the United States to have a Social Security program, help poor people, etc. And then after 19, uh, Roosevelt wins, and you get uh, the origins of the welfare state in the United States. Then the Republicans oppose, oppose, and then in order for the Republicans to get in, they have to say, okay, we can't win on that anymore. So the question now becomes, the Republicans aren't opposed to welfare, it's how much welfare. The Democrats become a party of more welfare, the Republicans less welfare. But, and the same thing is true in uh, England. Uh, Australia has election, the Irish, the election was uh, in the 1930s. But the point is that uh, polarization, that a party shifts, wins election, the other party continues to lose, then they change. And so that, that has not happened. It's a little harder for that to happen in the U.S. because of the of the 60 votes in the Senate uh, makes it more difficult. So that's the second thing I would change to allow. I don't know that personally I would go to getting rid of supermajority entirely, but and a lot of countries have some supermajority, but 60 votes is probably too many. Um, if you look at how Australia effectively runs its primaries, we effectively have um, uh, individual parties and particular um, you know, uh, electorates where the, the members of the party by and large, a very small percentage of the population, uh, choose a candidate. Right. Um, how do you think that system compares in terms of promoting or preventing polarisation? Because presumably that's at least been an option that a few people have considered in the States. Uh, if I could answer that question, I would, uh, I would be a shoe-in for the Nobel Prize. Uh, and so why is that a hard question? So... Well, so first of all, it's not that people in Australia's political parties within the same party don't have differences from each other. Uh, Mrs. Thatcher, think of England. Mrs. There were the wets and the dries in the Tory party. And uh, so the battles in the parties go on internally. And it's not clear. So imagine a battle going on in the party. Uh, it, it might be that, uh, so the party has 151 members. It might be that the policy goes to the 76th member, or it might be it goes a little left of that. It might be it goes a little right of that, but we're never going to see that because it's internal. In fact, in the British House of Commons, I don't know in Australia, but I know in the British uh, cabinet, you, they don't take votes. If, if you're a minister representing a particular position, 
you, you have to indicate by the strength of your argument, how hard you do it, et cetera, et cetera, your degree of opposition, and that's taken into consideration in some internal way. That makes it really hard to study. So it's not clear. It's how, in the United States, it's all in the open. It's all there, and Senator Nelson says, well, I'm not voting for that unless you give me this Medicare, and I'm not voting for that unless abort. It's all out in the open there, and, and in a parliamentary system, you can kind of bury it in, and that makes it a, a really difficult question to, uh, to, to get at. Uh, as to, and, and then the other thing is, in a parliamentary system, because you control the nomination, uh, direct, uh, you control the nomination, I have a greater incentive to go along. So you, you could bring me along. One example. So imagine there's a district in the United States that... So imagine the two parties are A, B, C, D, E on the left and whatever the last five, W, X, Y, Z, X, W, whatever the hell the last five are out there. Imagine uh, E is gun control and you're in Montana. So in the Australian system, you just nominate somebody that says for A, B, C, D, E, and he or she uh, just, uh, uh, you, and they'll vote for him because he's right on A, B, C. In the American system, if E is Montana and they don't want gun control, somebody, uh, somebody comes in and runs and says, I'm for A, B, C, D, Z, he wins, and the party split. And that uh, so the primary system drives it that way, and you can see how hard that is to collect data over time and then compare it to a, a parliamentary system as what's going on internally. And uh, in, in most of these things, you learn how it was done uh, 50 years or 40 years after when all the papers come out, because uh, Crossland's papers on the, on the wartime, uh, the wartime, and the, not just the wartime, but the post-wartime uh, Churchill cabinets is how we learn a lot of that stuff. So... Uh, so that so it's a million dollar question, as you can see, I don't have an answer. <laughs> right, well, I don't have... think I don't think there is one to that in any way that you could know, except that the incentives do favor. I think the incentives favor a parliamentary style system. Hmm. Thank you. Um, we should throw it open to the floor. So, if anyone has a question for uh, Professor Brady, please fire away. There's a microphone that will be coming towards you. So, if someone would like to go first up the front here. That's a great question. Uh, uh, until this last election, it didn't make much sense to study young people, nothing personal. Uh, you're all young to me. Uh, so, uh, because they, first of all, they just didn't vote. They, they really, people under 25 were the least likely to vote. Uh, most likely to be moved by short-term factors. So, uh, people under 25 were huge supporters of Reagan. And uh, and then huge supporters of Clinton, and uh, when you'd press them, it wasn't clear why. Uh, but the recent evidence shows that um, young voters are overwhelmingly Democratic in the United States over the last, uh, starting about 2002, uh, up till right to friend. They're very uh, enthusiastic, uh, very very uh, pro Democrat. So they tend to be a little bit more polarized. Uh, they're, they're, I think, the fourth most democratic group in the U.S. Uh, and when you add education, it goes even higher. Uh, so a young uh, person in college in the United States, the probability is like about 0.85 that they're a Democrat. And that's true for very few other groups, true for blacks, university professors, uh, and so on. But so that, so that there is data on this. Now, the real question comes down to what happens if, um, in 2000, uh, we do know in Massachusetts now, uh, no, the preliminary evidence shows that uh, the turnout and college campuses uh, for that Senate election was down uh, as high as 20% in precincts in, uh, Har Har in Cambridge precincts where Harvard and MIT people vote. And that data will become, I think they, what happens is they don't become Republicans. They just drop out. Or not drop out, they just don't vote. So I think that's what happens. Thank you. Uh, Fergus Green from Alan's Arthur Robinson. Um, as you know, in Australia, we have a system of compulsory voting. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you think the non-compulsory voting in the US affects polarization? Uh, <laughs> well, you do have some, uh, I have read some rather uh, 
esoteric statistical papers uh, on you have you do have ways of voting in Australia where you uh, I know you get fined but you can go in and mark I don't care or something I, I I'm sorry they're they were fairly technical papers with a lot of regressions and I don't remember so um, I, I don't think it affects my the, the people who don't vote in the United States are um, not very informed uh, if you made them vote. So he, we do know this, okay? There was, a, for a long time, the story of, well, the way the United States votes always hurts the parties of the left. And it hurts the parties of the left because the parties of the left are for the little guy, and who doesn't vote is the little, little guy doesn't go out and vote. So if the little guy doesn't vote, then if everybody voted, uh, all of our elections would be further left because... Uh, so there's a guy named Roy, uh, Roy Texiera, uh, and uh, the United States Census Bureau uh, runs these things, samples of uh, 700,000 Americans. And this guy, amazing study, he goes out and uh, takes random sample of that from uh, 1948 uh, until 2004. And then he actually does some technical things and goes out and checks how those people voted, and so we have people who voted, people who didn't vote. We have the vote intention of people who didn't vote, how they would have voted had they voted. And he actually did some checks to see how much lying there was because about 20% of America, if you ask Americans, did you vote? Oh, yeah, I voted. Uh, it's, the turnout would be like 86% of what it is uh, <laughs> because people don't like to say, no, I didn't vote. I don't care about that. So he did this amazing study, and what he shows is that in every election from 1948 to the present, had, other pe had the people who uh, didn't vote voted, the winning president would have won by more. And here's why. So in the United States, there's long-term forces of party identification. Generally, uh, the more partisan you are, the less likely you are to ever vote. For if you're a Democrat, you don't vote for Republicans. If you're a Republican, you don't vote for Democrats. So... The people who don't vote are people who aren't that interested. So what are they going to be moved by? They're going to be moved by the short-term forces. So the short-term forces that favored Eisenhower in 52, Bush in 2004, those are the forces that moved them. So in his very careful study, he shows that every American president would have been, a winner would have been elected with even more. So that, as far as I can tell you, that's the, that's the biggest effect, the, the short-term forces that move directions in one way. So in 2008, if we, just for example, if, if turnout had been 15% higher, then Obama would have won by more. Well, I, I, so normally, and, and this, is a, this is a hard question, because not, not what you'd want to answer that question is you want to look at the same people over time. Um, and in surveys, you, you can't do that because they're cross-sections, right? I've got 1,000 people here, 1,000 people here. Well, now because of Internet polling, the future of polling is actually not these telephone polls where uh, the turndown rate is so high and the face-to-face -to -face is too expensive. So the future of polling are these Internet polls where you have this pool, and so we have the same people. So, uh, so I can look at the same people from 2004 to 2010. Um, and by virtue of that, we have gone back. So then we can begin to do some rather uh, technical uh, estimation techniques. We've been able to go back now to the Gallup poll from 1937 and look at party identification and the preliminary, preliminary, uh, the answer is, over time, if our estimation techniques are right, what, what happens is that when the Democrats gain, the Republicans lose, or when the Republicans gain, the Democrats lose. Over the last uh, three, uh, two, two years, the rise of Democrat, the rise of independents, has uh, 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 is unique. And the de Republicans, even though uh, President Obama and the Democrats seem to not be in very good shape, the Republicans have picked up nothing. They're behind where they were in 2004. The Democrats are losing, and the rise of independence may be a sign that there are some uh, reasonable... So, And by reasonable, I personally would mean uh, 
fiscally conservative. And uh, so I think the average, uh, the, the median voter in the U.S. is uh, fiscally conservative and socially liberal, uh, socially liberal on, in regard to pro-choice, uh, uh, gay union, gay marriage, what, whatever you want. Uh, and so there's some evidence that that may be coming about. That's the best best answer I can give to you. But it, it is unique that this rise of independents and the decline of Democrats and Republicans looks to be unique over the period 37 to the present. So thank you all very much for coming. Uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Thank you.